The third thing that killed my father. I'll tell you what did my father mean. The third thing was dummy, and dummy died. The first thing was Pearl Harbor, and the second thing was moving to my grandfather's farm near Wenatchee. Wenatchee, Wenatchee. That's where my father finished out his days. Except they were probably finished before that. My father blamed Dummy's death on Dummy's wife. When he blamed it on the fish, and finally he blamed himself because he was the one that showed Dummy the ad in the back of Field and Stream for leave for live black bays shipped anywhere in the U.S. It was after he got the fish that Dummy started acting peculiar. The fish changed Dummy's whole life personality. That's what my father said. I never knew Dummy's real name. <coughs> Dummy's real name. If anyone did, I never heard it. Dummy, it was then, and it's Dummy. I remember him by now. He was a little wrinkled man, bald-headed, short but very powerful in arms and legs. If he grinned, which was seldom, his lips folded, folded back over brown, broken teeth that gave him a crafty expression. His watery eyes stayed fastened on your mouth when you were talking, and if you weren't, it would go to some place queer on your body. I don't think he was really deaf, at least not as deaf as he made out. But he sure couldn't talk. That was for certain. Deaf or no, Dummy had been on as a common labourer out at the sawmill since the 1920s. It was the Cascade Lumber Company in Yakima, Washington. The years I knew him. Dummy was working as a clean-up man, and all those years I never saw him with anything different on, meaning a felt hat, a khaki work shirt, a denim jacket over a pair of coveralls. In his top pockets, he carried rolls of toilet paper. As one of his jobs was to clean and supply the toilet. It kept him busy, seeing as how the men on nights he used to walk off after the tools, with a row or two in their lunch boxes. Dummy carried a flashlight. Even though he worked days, he also carried wrenches, wrenches, pliers, screwdrivers, friction tape, all the same things that meal rides carried. Well, it made he, made them kid Dummy the way he was, always carrying everything. Carl Lowry, Ted Slate, Johnny Waite, they were the worst kidders of the one that kidded Dummy. But Dummy took it all in stride. I think he'd gotten used to it. My father never kidded Dummy, not to my knowledge anyway. Dad was a big, heavy-shouldered man with a cruel haircut, double chin, and a belly of real size. Dummy was always staring at that belly. He'd come to the filing room where my father worked, and he'd sit on the stool and watch my dad belly while he used the big emery am- wheels on the saws. Dummy had a house as good as anyone's. It was a ta ta paper covered affair near the river, five or six miles from town, half a mile behind the house. At the end of a pasture, there lay a big gravel pit that the state had dug when they were paving the roads around there. Three good sized sized holes had been scooped out, and over the years, it filled with water. By and by, the three ponds came together to make one. It was deep. It was the darkest to look to it. Dummy had a wife as well as a house. She was a woman years younger and set to go round with Mexicans. Father said it was busybodies that said that men like Lowry and Wait and Slade. She she was a small, stout woman with glittery little eyes. The first thing I saw her. First time I saw her, saw those eyes. It was when it was when I was with Pete Jensen, and we were on our bicycles, and we stopped at Dummy's to get a glass of water. When he opened, when she opened the door, I told her I was Del Fraser's son. I said he works with. And then I realized, you know, your husband. We were on our bicycles and thought we could get a drink. Wait here, she said. She came back with a little tin cup of water in each hand. I downed mine in a single gulp, but she didn't offer us more. She watched us without saying anything. When we started to get on our bicycles, he came over to the edge of the porch. You little fellas had a car now. I might catch a ride with you. She grinned. Her teeth looked too big for her mouth. Let's go, Pete said. And we went. There weren't too many places you could fish for bass. 
for bays in our part of the state. It was rainbow mostly, a few brook and dolly burden in some of the high mountain streams and silvers in blue lake and lake rim rock. That was almost、um, mostly it. That was mostly it, except for that runs of steelhead and salmon in some of the freshwater rivers in late fall. But if you were a fisherman, it was enough to keep you busy. No one fished for bays. A lot of people I knew had never seen a bay except for pictures. But my father had seen plenty of them when he was growing up in Arkansas and Georgia, and he had high hopes to do with them in space. Them being a friend. The day the fish arrived, I'd gone swimming at the city pool. I remember coming home and going out again to get them, since Dad was going to give them in the hand. Three tanks passed a post from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Who went in Dummy's pickup? Dad and Dummy and me. These tanks turned out to be barrels. Really, the three of them crated in pine la- pine leaf. They were standing in the shade out back of the train depot, and it took my dad and Dummy both to lift each crate into the truck. Then we drove very carefully through town. Just as carefully all the way to his house, he went right through his yard without stopping. He went on down to within feet of the pond. By that by that time, it was nearly dark, so he kept his headlights on and took out a hammer and, and a tie iron from under the seat. And then the two of them lugged the crate up close to the water and started tearing open the first one. The bare inside was wrapped in. Burlap, burlap, and there were these nickel-sized holes in the lid. They raised it off, and Dummy aimed his flashlight in. It looked like a medium, but base fingerlings were f- f- filling inside. It was the strangest sight. All those li- live things busy in there, like a little ocean and then a comb on the train. Dummy scooted the barrel to, to the edge of the water. And pulled it out. He took his flashlight and shined it onto the pond. But there was nothing to be seen anymore. You could hear the frogs going, but you could hear them go. Every time I knew it got dark. Let me get the other crates, my father said. And he reached over as if to take the hammer from the dummy's coveralls. But let me put back and shook his head. He undid the other two crates himself, leaving dark drops of blood on the leather when he ripped his hand doing it. From that night on, Dummy was different. Dummy wouldn't let anyone come around now anymore. He put up fences all around the pasture. Then he fenced off the pond with electrical barbed wire. He said it was cost it cost him all his savings for the fence. Of course, my father wouldn't have anything to do with Dummy after that. Not since Dummy ran him off. Not from fishing, mind you, because the bays was just baby stew. But even from trying to get a look, one evening two years after, when Dad was working late and took him his food and jar by his tea, I found him standing talking with Sid Glover, the mill wright. As I just just as I came in, I heard Dad saying, "Never con that fool was married to them fish the way he act." From what I hear, Sid said. He'd do better to put that fence round his house. My father saw me then, and I saw him seeing signals see the glow of his eyes. But a month later, but a month later, my dad finally made Dummy do it. What he did was he told Dummy how he had to thin out the weak ones on account of keeping things fit for the rest of them. Dummy stood there, pulling at his car ear and staring at the floor. Dad said. Yeah, he'd be down to do it tomorrow because it had to be done. I mean, never said yes. Actually, he just never said no. Is all. All he did was put on his car some more. When Dad got home that day, I was ready and waiting. I had him out the base plugs, plugs out, and were testing the treble hooks with my finger. You, s- you said he called to me, jumping out of the car. I go to the toilet. You put the stuff in. You can drive us out there if you want. I'd stowed everything in the back seat and was trying out the wheel when he came back from 
walking back out, wearing his fishing hat and eating a wedge of cake with both hands. Mother was standing in the door, watching. She was a fair-skinned woman, her blonde hair put back in a tight bun, bun, and fastened down with a rhinestone clip. I wonder if she ever went around back in those happy days, or what she ever really did. Let out the handbrake. Mother watched until I had shifted gears, and then, still unsmiling, she went back inside. It was a fine afternoon. We had all the windows down to let the air in. We crossed the Moxie Bridge and swung west onto Slater Road. Alfalfa fields stood off to either side, and farther on it was cornfield. Dad had his hand out the window. He was letting the wind carry it back. He was restless. I could see. It wasn't long before we put our bed dummies. He came out of the house wearing his hat. His wife was looking out the window. You got your frying pan ready? Dad hollered out to Dummy, but Dummy just stood there, eyeing the car. Hey, Dummy! Dad yelled. Hey, Dummy! What's your pole, Dummy? Dummy jerked his head back and forth. He moved his weight from one leg to the other and looked at the ground and then alert. His tongue rested on his lower lip and he began walking his foot into the dirt. He showed it the creel. I handed down his pole and picked up my own. We set to go? That's it. Hey, Dummy, we set to go? Dummy took off his hat and with the same hand, he wiped his wrist over his hand. Head, he turned abruptly and we followed him across the spongy pasture. Every twenty feet or so, a snip sprang out from the clumps of grass at the edge of old furrow, few furrows. At the end of the pasture, the ground sloped gently and became dry and rocky. Nettle bushes and scrub oaks scattered here and there were cut to the right, filling in the note set of car tracks. Going through a field of milkweed uh, that came up to our waist, the dry pods at the tops of the stalk rattling angrily as we pushed through. Presently, I saw the sheen of water over Dummy's shoulder and I heard that shout, Oh Lord, look at that! But Dummy slowed down and kept bringing his hand up and moving his head back and forth over his head and then he just stopped flat. That's a, well, what do you think, Dummy? One place glares than another. Where do you say we should come unto it? Dummy wet his lower lip. What's the matter with you, Dummy? Dad said. It's your pawn, ain't it? Dummy looked down and picked an ant off his coveralls. Well, well. Dad said, letting out his breath. He took out his watch. If it's still alright with you, we'll get to it before it gets too dark. Dummy stuck his hand in his pocket and turned back to the pond. He started walking again. We trailed along behind. You could see the whole pond now. The water dimpled with dimpled with rising fish. Every so often, a vessel will leap clear and come down in a splash. Great God, I heard my father say. We came up to the pond at an open place. Grover Beach, kind of. Dad mentioned to me and dropped into a crouch. I dropped too. He was peering into the water in front of us. When I looked, I saw what had taken him. So, honest to God, he whispered. A score of bays who were cruising, 20, 30, not one of them under two pounds. They veered off and they shifted and came back so densely spaced they looked like they were bumping up against each other. I could see their big, heavy lidded eyes watching us as they went by. They flashed away again and again, they came back. They were asking for it. It didn't make any difference if we stayed squatted or stood up. The fish just didn't think of it thing about it, I tell you, it was a slight on be oh, a slight it was a slight it was a sight to behold. We sat there for quite a while watching that school of bays go so innocently about their business dummy the whole time, pulling at his fingers and looking around as we expected someone to show up. All over the pond the bays were coming up 
to nuzzle the water or jumping clear and falling back or coming up to the surface to swim along with their dorsal sticking out. That signaled that I got up to cast. I tell you, I was shaking with excitement. I could hardly get the plug loose from the cork hand of my pole. It was while I was trying to get the hooks out that I felt Dummy seize my shoulder with his big fingers and looks, and then also Dummy walked his chain in that direction. What he wanted was clear enough, no more than one pole. Dad took off his hat and then pulled it back on and then he moved over to where I stood. You go on, Jack. That's all right, son. You do it now. I looked at Dummy just before I laid out my cast. His face had gone rigid and there was a thin line of drool on his chin. Come back, stout on a sucker on his drags. Dad said, sons of bitches gone mouth hard as doorknobs. Doorknobs. I flipped off the drag lever and threw back my arm. I sent it out a good 40 feet. The water was boiling even before I had time to take up the slack. Hit him! That yelled, hit the son of a bitch. Hit him good. I came back hard twice. I had him all right. The, the rod bowed over and jerked back and forth. Dad kept yelling what to do. Let him go, let him go, let him run. Give him more line. Now winding, winding, no, let him run, Wee! when you look at that. The bass danced around the pond, every time it came about at the wa- out of the water it shook its head so hard you could hear the pluck rattle and then he'd take off again. But by and by I wore him out and had him in up close, he looked enormous, six or seven pounds maybe, he lay on his side whipped mouth open grills working my knees felt so weak I could hardly stand but I held the rod up the line tight that waded out over his shoes but when he reached for the fish then he started squattering shaking his head waving his arms now what the hell's the matter with you dummy the boy's got hold of the biggest bass I've ever seen and he ain't going to throw him back by god let me cut the carrying on and just run toward the pond. It ain't about to let this boy's fish go. You hear me, dummy? You've got another thing coming if you think I'm going to do that. Dummy reached for my line. Meanwhile, the bass had gained some strength back. He turned himself over started swimming again. I yelled. Then I lost my head and slammed down to the bed, break on the reel and I started winding. The bass made a last, furious run. I was that. The line broke. I almost fell over on my back. Come on, Jack. That said, I saw him grappling up his pole. Come on, goddamn the fool, before I knock the man down. That February, the river flooded. It had snowed pretty heavy the first weeks of December and turned real cold before Christmas. Grand froze. The snow stayed where it was. But toward the end of January, the Chinook wing struck. I woke up one morning to hear the house getting buffeted. Buffet, buffeted and a steady drizzle of water running off the roof. It blew for five days and on the third day the river began to rise. It is up to 15 feet, my father said one evening looking over his newspaper, which is three feet over what you need to flood. Old Dummy going to lose his darlings. I wanted to go down to the Moxie Bridge to see how high the water was running, but my dad wouldn't let me. He said the flood was nothing to see. Two days later, the river crested, and after that, the water began to subside. Ori Marshall and Danny Owens and I bicycled out to Dummies one morning, a week late after. We parked our bicycles and walked across the pasture that bordered Sammy's property. It was a wet, blustery day, the cloud dark and broken moving fast across the sky. The ground was soapy wet and we kept coming to puddles in the thick grass. Then it was just learning how to cuss and he filled the air with the best he had every time he stepped in over his shoes. He would see the swollen river at the end of the pasture. The water was still high and out of its channel, surging around the trunks. <gasps> Tr-
trees and eating away at the edge of the land. Out towards the middle, the current moved heavy and swift, and now and then a bush floated by, all the tree with its branches sticking up. We came to Dummy's fence and found a cow wedged in up against the wire. She was bloated and her skin was shiny looking and grey. It was the first dead thing of any size we've seen. I remember Oring took a stick and touched the open knife. <clears throat> we moved on down the fence to walk the river. We were afraid to go near the wire because we thought it might still have electricity in it. But at the edge of what looked like a deep canal, the fence came to an end. The ground had simply dropped into the water here and the fence along with it. We crossed over the floor of the new channel that cut directly into Dummy's land and headed straight for his pond, going into its lengthwise and forcing an outlet for itself at the other end, and twisting off until it joined up with the river far farther on. We didn't doubt that most of Dummy's fish had been carried off, but those that hadn't been were free to come and go. Then I caught sight of Dummy. It scared me seeing him. I meant a motion, a motion to the other fellows, and we all got down. Dummy was standing at the far side of the pond, near where the water was rushing out. He was just standing there, the saddest man I've ever saw. I sure do feel sorry for old Dummy, though, my father said at supper a few weeks later. Mind, the poor devil brought, brought it on himself, but you can't help but be troubled for him. Dad went on to say George Laycock saw so Dummy's wife sitting on a sportsman club with a big Mexican fellow. And that ain't the half of it, Mother look up, look up at him sharply and then at me. But I just went on eating like I hadn't heard a thing. That's it. Damn it to hell, be it. The boy's old enough. It changed a lot. Dummy head. He was never around any of the men anymore, not if he could help it. No one felt like joking with him either. Not since he chased the car lower with a two by four stud after a car tipped Dummy's head off. But the worst of it was that Dummy was missing from work a day or two. A week on the average now, and there was some talk of his being laid off. The man's going off the deep end, he said. Clear crazy, if he don't watch out. And on a Sunday afternoon, just before my birthday, Dad and I were cleaning the gar garage. It was a warm, drifty day. You could see the dust hanging in the air. Mother came to the back door and said, Now it's for you. I think it's Van. I followed Dad in to wash up. We were through talking. They put the phone down and turned to us. The stummy said, Didn't Dilling his wife with a hammer and drowned himself. Everyone just heard it in town. When we got out there, cars were parked all around. The gate to the pasture stood open, and I could see tire marks that led on to this pond. The screen door was propped ajar from a bo with a box, and there was this lean, pock faced man in slacks and sports uh, sports shirt wear a shoulder holster. He watched Dad and me get out of the car. Out his friend, Dad said to the man. The man shook his head. Don't care who you are. Play off unless you've got business here. Did they find him, Dad said. They're dragging, the man said, and adjusted the feet of his gun. All right if we walk down? I knew him pretty well, the man said. Take your chances, they chase you off, don't say you wasn't warned. We went on across the page, taking pretty much the same route we had if they were tried fishing. There were motorboats going on the pond, dirty fluffs of exhaust turning over it. You could see where the high water had cut away the ground and carried off trees and rocks. The two boats had uniforms and men in them, and they were going back and forth, one man steering and the other man handling the rope and hooks. An ambulance waited on the gravel beach, where we set ourselves to pass for Dummy's base. Two men in white launched against the back, smoking cigarettes. One of the motorboats cut off. We all looked up. Man in back stood up and started having 
heaving on his rope. After a time, an arm came out of the water. It looked like the hooks had gotten dummy on the in his side. The arm went back down and then he come out, came out again, along with a bundle of something. It's not him, I thought. It's something else that has been in there for years. The men in the front of the boat moved to the back, and together the two men hauled to the ripping thing over the side. I looked at Dad. His face was funny the way it was set. Women, he said. He said that's what the wrong kind of woman can't, can do to you, Jack. But I don't think that really believed it. I think he just didn't know who to blame or what to say. It seemed to me everything took a bad turn for my father after that. Just like Dummy, he wasn't the same man anymore. That arm coming up and going back down in the water. It was like a so long to good times and hello to bad. Because it was nothing but that all the years after Danny's drowned himself in the dark water. Is that what happens when a friend dies? Bad luck for the pal pals he left behind. But as I said, Pearl Harbor and, ha and having to move back to his dad's place didn't do my dad one bit of good either.